Hello. When studying gods of the Roman Empire or Christianity's origin, chances are you will come across the cult of Mithras. Now, there's a lot of talk floating around about this cult, especially with its parallels to Christianity. But as we will see, these are generally unfounded. In this video, we'll be examining the cult of Mithras by looking at what we can work out about that religion through the iconography temples dedicated to Mithras had. And then what these can really tell us about the story of the cult of Mithras. So welcome to the story of the cult of Mithras and welcome to Crokenfold. Despite all the talk of Mithras, the cult of Mithras is, in two different ways, somewhat of a mystery. One, it was known as a mystery cult, and that means that you had to become more involved in the cult to work your way up its ranks to learn more of its secrets. But this doesn't mean the cult itself was a secret, it wasn't. And it was reasonably well known across the Roman Empire. And two, is because we don't know much about it considering how popular it was. Primary source documented evidence of the actual rituals or beliefs of the cult just don't exist. And this is why we're looking at the archaeological evidence left in the temples, the statues and the reliefs that may allow us to understand this cult better. So what do we not know? Well, apart from the rituals and beliefs, we're not even sure when Mithraism started. The earliest evidence we have is the discovery of its primary motif, which is Mithras slaying a bull. And that was found on a monument built at the very end of the first century CE in Rome. And it showed this primary motif with Mithras, a man who was dressed as an Anatolian or in Persian costume. And he was shown slaying a bull by cutting its throat. And this, along with the name Mithras, suggests it was a religion inspired by the Indo-Iranian deities, either Zoroastrian Mithra or the Rig Vedas Mitra. Although, with the Persian costume being shown in the motifs, it would suggest that the Persian culture influenced the religion more. And this is even important in understanding the difference between the Roman religion of Mithras and the other religions that use similar imagery, or were Persian religions themselves. This is why the scene of Mithras slaying a bull, which is known as Toloctony, uh, and it is something we will look at and understand a bit more about the cult's beliefs uh, later. Uh, but with all this, we can infer that the cult of Mithras started in Rome around the first century around the same time the stories of Christianity came to Rome. And because of this, its timing, it seems that the rise of Mithras coincides with that of Christianity. And so it's probably one of the key reasons why there are comparisons with Christianity now. And it is possible that it did rival Christianity in some places for a couple of hundred years. However, Mithraism would eventually die out during the fifth century due to various reasons we will also cover. So what do we know about it? Well, archaeological evidence shows that by the 3rd century, the cult of Mithras had established temples across the Roman Empire, from Britain to the Near East, with over 100 found so far, as shown in this map. The concentrations of temples on the Roman Empire's borders and in Rome. And this helps strengthen other evidence that the religion was very popular with soldiers in the Roman army. The discovery of the temples have contributed enormously to our understanding of the cult of Mithras, and in particular the scenes carved or painted in the temple. These reliefs are important as there are only a few fragments of written narratives which mention the religion that still survive. And so inference must be made from the reliefs, archaeology and secondary information. But because it's always inferred, they can be contested and challenged. And so we just have to be really sure that we have enough evidence to justify any inference. Uh, just know that there aren't many things we are 100% sure about. Now, the cult members would meet in these temples known as Mithraeum, and these were often small and were either underground or undercover, in effect small dark places looking to emulate a cavern, for reasons we will understand soon. And there would be particular light sources within the temple, and these would be used to highlight imagery and iconography on the walls, emphasising the importance of these. So let's look at this iconography, and we'll start with the main motif, which was Mithras slaying a bull, and it appeared above the altars at the end of the temple. Now, this imagery is something that would not be associated with Persian or Vedic deities, the gods 
Mitra or Mitra. So it seems to be a very specific Roman idea. And that helps us understand Mithras further. There are many examples of this scene where it's surrounded by further icons representing Mithras' life, allowing further understanding of what Mithras did. But first, we look at the Toroctony, uh, this image of Mithras slaying a bull. The scene itself is taking place inside a cavern, which would be represented by the temple, and explains the temple's dimensions and darkness. And the story of Mithras, we know, is that he had hunted down a bull and brought it into this cavern to slay. And we'll verify that in a few minutes. In this central image, a representation of Sol would appear on the top left of the entrance in the cavern, sometimes riding in a four-horse chariot. In this example, Sol is wearing a sun crown, sending light down to Mithras, who himself is looking over his shoulder at Sol. This suggests there is a strong link between Sol Invictus and Mithras, and that the sacrifice of the bull is being done for the benefit of Sol. On the top right of the scene is Luna, the moon deity sometimes seen in a two-horse chariot. But here, he's watching the events and is often associated with the crescent-shaped imagery. In the centre of the scene, Mithras is depicted killing the bull and is in an Anatolian or Persian costume, which is not only inferred from his clothes, but also his hat, which was popular in the region, a Phrygian cap. And in some reliefs, he also wears a quiver on his back with a bow placing the scene behind him. And whilst not in this scene, I will show an example of one in a minute. Mithras himself is shown kneeling on the bull, which itself is shown kneeling on the ground. This suggests exhaustion from the fight. Mithras holds the bull's nostrils with his left hand while stabbing it with a dagger or short sword with his right. Below the wound, there is always a dog trying to lick blood from the wound and a snake here which is risen by a jar known as a crater and through the open jaws of a lion the lion which is sometimes represented separately, as it too reaches towards the blood of the wounded bull. A raven is either depicted flying around, sitting on, or, as represented here, sitting near the bull. And below the bull, near its hind legs, is a scorpion. Wheat is either shown coming from the wound, or from the tail of the bull, and here the tail ends in seven heads of wheat. And around the scene are two torchbearers, known as Cortes, and Cotopates, known as Dadophores, and they either carry torches with one facing up and one facing down, or they carry shepherd's crooks. Here are some other examples. In this statue, held at the Vatican, we can see more clearly the dog and snake, although Mithras isn't turning his head as there is no soul deity in this representation. And in this relief, which is found in V in 2009, we can point out the features. And this does show Sol in his four-horse chariot on the top right, and has Mithras in possession of a quiver and a bow. And I'll highlight these now, so you can hopefully see them more clearly. And now I'll go back to the relief to give you a chance to pick them out of the actual photo. So, the icons were common amongst many temples, and the central image of the slaying of the bull was almost identical in all temples. But what did this mean? Well, the cult itself was a mystery cult, meaning that only as you became more involved in the cult would secrets be made available to you. We know from archaeological evidence, from imagery in these temples that have been discovered, that the cult had seven tiers, and that were linked to um, zo the zodiac, and individuals could ascend through the ranks through rituals. Now, one of the pieces of archaeological evidence found was a mosaic floor from Ostia, which I'll show you on the side. And if we look at this closely, we can see that the ranks themselves are displayed through some related imagery that appear in some of that iconography. And those ranks were named as follows. Raven being represented by the planet Mercury, the bridegroom being Venus, the soldier being Mars, Leo being Jupiter, Persian being the moon, the sun runner being the sun, and the father of the sun being Saturn. And so, all ranks were related to the sacrifice of the bull, with some being more involved than others, dependent on the rank. And the status of your Mithras rank was taken very seriously. The most common scene uh, from inscriptions of dedications being that of Lion, or called Leo as a zodiac sign. And so above that, you would uh, meet and you'd have significant influence within the cult. 
And whilst this seems only to be, and whilst this seems to be a male-only cult, any male could join, even slaves. Although your ranking would be affected by your social standing, and as such, no slaves would ever say be ranked uh, above soldiers in the Roman armies. Um, and these soldiers would take the rank seriously, and they would not only not want slaves not ranked above them. But in the army, they would be expected to wear different headdresses because of the use of the crown of Mithras. In, in a spiritual sense, they already thought they were wearing a helmet, so to wear another with adornments would be wrong. Other information we found about the initiation uh, refers to handshakes, and the cult were known as syndexioi, which means connected by handshake, which may have been taken from the Persian tradition of signifying an agreement between two people with a handshake. Although, as an aside, the earliest handshake is depicted in a 3,000 year old relief from Assyria, with an Assyrian shaking hands with a Babylonian, and I'll put a picture of that now. Now, the story of Mithras doesn't end there, uh, as there's lots of other iconography representing key moments in Mithras's life, uh, and this is all around the central imagery. And occasionally, these pictures are just signs of the zodiac, which would make sense uh, now we know what the signs of the zodiac actually represent in terms of ranks. But there are other images there too. So what other information is there? Well, let's look at the examples surrounding this central scene uh, to see if it hints about the story of Mithras and his life. This iconography does change between temples, but there's still a lot of commonality. And in the example I'm showing, top border has six scenes, which is made up of three scenes of two, starting from the outside and coming inwards. First, the top left and top right show the heads of the wind gods, and with their wings in their hair, and cones of wind coming out of their mouths. Mithra stands naked in front of the left-hand god, wearing his hat, and is next to probably what is a cypress tree, from which he is breaking a branch, and he is climbing a cypress tree in front of the right-hand wind god. Moving inwards, on the top icons, we see two arches in a Persian costume posing in opposite directions on either side, half kneeling and using a large Scythian bow aiming at a large overhanging rock. This is probably a reference to a story that we see on monuments to Mithras along the Danube in Europe, where he fires an arrow at the rock to encourage water to come forth, with some referring to this as the water miracle, but is in fact a mythogen, originating from stories that probably started because of drought in the area where the religion began as it is a common theme represented in temples. This view is not only because we know that Persia to be relatively light in rainfall, but also Europe, as told in the story of the rain miracle, and where many of the soldiers who fought for the Roman Empire were stationed, and they could well have been members of the cult of Mithras, and they would have known about this situation, this miracle, and therefore found it analogous to the situation Mithras was trying to resolve. The middle two icons show Sol on the left riding his four-horse sun wagon across the heavens, with Mithras dressed in a Persian attire behind him, trying to seize Sol's mantle to mount the chariot. Middle right is Luna, nude and holding a whip in her left hand. She commands her two-horse chariot as she descends behind a rock. As mentioned earlier, these images sometimes appear in the main central image, but here they are separated. If we now move to the left hand side we have four more images and starting at the bottom we have a figure kneeling in a Persian costume, one knee on the ground supporting a disc or boulder on his shoulders. Above is a bearded figure laying down, reclining, wearing a mantle, which is like a loose cloak, and holding what appears to be a thunderbolt, maybe a representation of Jupiter. Above this we have two characters, on the left one wearing clamias and a diadem and he is receiving a scepter to show he is the ruler of the world from a character carrying a harp. Now these characters could either be Zeus on the left and Kronos on the right in the representation of the Greek gods, but due to the Persian orientation of Mithraism, it may well be Ahura Mazda, the highest spirit in Zoroastrianism, receiving the scepter from Zervan, the deity of the primordial creation. And the top left picture is that of Mithras being born from a rock holding a globe high in his left hand and in his right hand a knife. In some images representing his birth, he can be holding a flaming torch as opposed to a globe, and other weapons such as bows and arrows. He can appear naked, as in this example, or clothed, sometimes as a child, or a man. 
is better represented from the bath of Diocletian, dated around 186 CE. In further examples, animals are included from dogs and lions to eagles and serpents. And some show gods such as lunar souls or Saturn. And Saturn sometimes handing the dagger to Mithras, the dagger which could be used to kill the bull. As though the primary god allows Mithras to kill the bull for him. To the right hand side there are four more pictures which we'll read from top to bottom. First we have a bull facing left grazing on the grass. Then below this Mithras in his Persian costume carrying the bull across his shoulders holding it by its hooves. Mithras is looking behind him as though something could be pursuing him. Below this the bull is galloping away with Mithras holding on around the bull's neck and laying across the bull's back. And the last picture shows Mithras dragging the bull with him. These four scenes are basically showing the story of Mithras catching and fighting a bull, riding it to exhaustion before he drags it back to the cavern where the central scene takes place and Mithras kills the bull. And sometimes the main relief itself is two-sided, allowing it to be turned, showing a picture of the feast, which indicates that the ceremony of Mithras may have had two parts within the temple, a sacrifice and then a feast the bull skin laid across the table to emulate the image depicted. Though there's actually been no evidence of any bull sacrifice having taken place in any of the temples we've found so far. Now this feast scene shows Mithras and Sol having a banquet together in a room where one of the torchbearers lights an altar. Some academics believe this represents the release of souls. Certainly the use of light within Mithria is known some of the altars having holes through them, so the light at the back would shine through for these holes for a particular effect. Remember, the temples would be dark, so it would really stand out. And the use of feasting to celebrate gods was a common Roman trait, uh, and it was mistaken by some Christians, one being Justin Martyr around 145 CE, who's a Christian apologist. Um, and we know how reliable they are if you look at the other videos I've made. Um, but Justin wrote that the drinking of a cup of water and eating bread uh, at a ritual was copying Christianity, where in fact it was just a standard way of celebrating the gods in Rome. And this just was highlighting uh, the fact that Justin Martyr might be just doing what Christian apologists do, which is tarnish other religions and here tarnish the cult of Mithras. So one question we have is why is soul represented so much? With Mithras looking at Sol during the killing of the bull and then the feasting with him after. Well, some altars have been found in locations that would have been in Germania, calling God Sol Invictus Mithras. And there is a clear connection here. It wasn't unknown for Romans to combine the names of gods, especially when combining a Roman and non Roman god. The iconography around the centerpiece sometimes shows Mithras walking and talking to Sol. Now, this may well be influenced from the Persian history of Mitra, a god first found in tablet writings from the 14th century BCE, yeah, who, who evolved into a Persian sun god by the 5th century BCE, and to who the Zoroastrianism religion considered to be the god of light, waging war against the darkness. However, this connection is about the only thing that the Roman Mithras took from the Persian and Zoroastrianism religions. There's no other religious continuity between Zoroastrianism and what we know of the cult of Mithras. So the rituals and worships were completely different. It was definitely a Roman religion, but perhaps influenced by Persian soldiers or Roman soldiers fighting in Persia. This connection with Sol Invictus has led some to believe that Mithras had a festival of birth on the 25th of December and a connection with Jesus, who was born on the same day. There is no evidence to infer this above speculation. In fact, there is a bronze plaque called Virunum Album, a plaque that shows Mithras members' grades, and it has inscribed on it that a festival took place on the 26th of June, 184 CE. And this falls very close to the summer solstice, and again, may further indicate a strong connection with the soul. We also know that Jesus' birth date was formalised after the establishment of Mithras, and you can see more about that in this video. But with Saturnalia, the god of Saturn, that represents the father of the sun rank and Sol Invictus falling close to and on the 25th of December, 
given Mithras his links to Sol, can seem that there is a link, even if there's no actual evidence to support this, apart from this coincidence. The last piece of symbology we like to look at is the lion-headed figure, which again leaves more questions than answers. The majority of Mithraic temples have a representation of a lion-headed man who is a figure of a, a naked man's body with a lion's head and with two serpents entwined around him. This lion man is often represented as having four wings, representing one for each season. Uh, he has an open mouth and a thunderbolt on his chest. And in one hand, he will hold a scepter. Now by his feet are the hammer and tongs of Vulcan, who is the god of fire. Uh, and there's also a representation of the cockle of Mercury and a wand. And there are examples of this figure with a human head, but with a lion's head emerging from in the chest. Now, this type of figure does not seem to have an equivalent in Persian, Greek or Egyptian mythology. And so its origin and purpose remains a complete mystery. However, inscriptions on altars refer to this figure as Arimanius, uh, which is the Latin equivalent of Ariman, who was a demon in the Zoroastrian pantheon. And this name is also represented in the Vedic Ariman. Now, though some scholars think it may represent um, Zuren or Kronos, so perhaps it just represents a demon being wrapped up by snakes as well and taken over by the lion in the hope of reducing the chances of demons affecting the world. We just don't know. And so, what I can say is with all these images to look at, can we say about Mithras in terms of was it similar to Christianity then? Well, Tertullian, a Christian, who wrote towards the end of the second century, um, said that as part of the initiation, members were also bathed and given a mark on their forehead, something he considered a diabolical counterfeit of baptism. But other religions used the baptism, a cleansing analogy. This baptism, baptism in general, is not a Christian invention. And we do not know... Um, whether Mithras died and rose after three days. In fact, it doesn't look like he did. It doesn't look like he had 12 disciples. What we have found written is most anti Mithraism sort of propaganda from the very pro Christian sources. Christian apologists and their writings have probably been crafted to be less than factual, you know, to cast aspersions on Mithras rather than necessarily tell the truth. And it could well have been that the Christianity lifted some rituals from Mithraism even. So, finally, uh, let's not also forget about the virgin birth. And Mithras was born from a rock, which doesn't really sound like a virgin birth to me. But why it started, we're unsure about. Maybe things were happening in the war that made men need a specific type of god. Even today, a soldier on the front line who considers himself an atheist may soon doubt his views when his life seems in doubt. And think about the central image of Mithras. There are no others around, no Romans looking on to admire the scene. This can be seen as a religion away from the Roman norm, maybe to distance itself from the political side of the Roman Empire. What we can probably say for certain is that a cult aimed at soldiers would not become as popular as Christianity. And that was aimed at all members of the family. That, along with the fall of the Roman Empire, along with its war with Persia, which would have made this Persian influence religion less popular. And if you couple this with the rise of Christianity and the power the Roman Catholic Church was having and its intent to literally wipe out as much of the other religions as possible, that probably the main causes that made the cult of Mithras disappear. Now, there are specific elements I can dig deeper into, but this was just meant to be a brief introduction into Mithras. Uh, one that I hope has presented to you some new thoughts and images uh, about the, the, one of the best known religions that we know so little about. So I'll leave this there and that was the story of Mithras. So stay safe. Take care. This is Crackenford.